Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here today. So if you are somebody, and I know you are, because I think we all have this happen to us, where you wake up in the morning with the best intentions that you are going to eat right today, you're going to eat clean, you're going to eat nothing but vegetables and clean meats, and you're going to stick with that diet plan today, and then you get to work and somebody there brings, brings in the cupcakes or the chocolates, and it's almost like something takes over your brain and your body, and it's like you can't stop yourself from reaching out and grabbing one. And then you beat yourself up because you don't have the willpower. Well, today we're going to tell you why this happens, why we are wired to grab the cupcake, as I like to say. We're going to dive into calorie restricted diets. If they work, do we should we be using it, the calorie in, calorie out model? What does it do to how does it benefit us as well as how does it damage us and our metabolism? And with me today is Stefan Gian Gianne, author of The Hungry Brain, Outsmarting the Instincts That Make Us Overeat. He is an obesity researcher whose work ties together neuroscience, physiology, evolutionary biology, and nutrition to offer explanations and solutions for our global weight problem. And he is also somebody that I followed for years, and I've learned a ton from him. So welcome, Stefan. Thanks. Good to be here, Karen. Yes. And you're not far from me. You're just just down across that border. That's right. Pacific down Northwest. Down in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you were saying that it's actually sunny down there, which like yeah. you, it's like overcast here. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so um, first of all, let's just give our audience a little bit of background about what you do and you know what it is that uh, you're the expert in. Yeah, absolutely. So my background is in um, neuroscience and obesity research. So I um, got my PhD at the University of Washington in neurobiology and behavior and then used that degree to move into the neuroscience of obesity, also at the University of Washington. So I did a postdoc studying the um, system in the brain that actually regulates our appetite and body fatness and how that system changes when we become obese. And so um, during the course of that research, I kind of came to realize that there's a lot about these systems and there's a lot about the control of eating behavior and the control of body fatness that people don't know about. It's not really making its way from the scientific community to the general public. And so that led me to write my book, The Hungry Brain, and so the hungry brain, and, and just to be clear, most of the research that's in the hungry brain is not research that I conducted myself you know, at the laboratory bench. It's mostly other people's research, but um, being part of that field allowed me access to a lot of these researchers and it gave me an understanding of what was going on. And so that book is my attempt to uh, make um, a big picture explanation of uh, why we overeat and why we gain fat and why it's so hard to lose weight and do that in a way that my fellow researchers think is reasonable. Um, And so, you know, it's not, I don't view it as, you know, another kind of diet guru book or, you know, pop fad diet book. It's really just an explanation in, you know, insofar as I was able to make it in, you know, terms that are understandable to a general audience and easy to digest, it is just me trying to explain what's going on. And um, yeah, and then since then, I am um, working on various other things. I'm no longer uh, at an academic institution, but I'm self-employed and working for a couple of different organizations doing science-related things. And then also continuing periodically to publish in the scientific literature. So, for example, I have a paper coming out soon that's a systematic review paper on the impact of whole fresh fruit consumption on body fatness. Oh, geez, we could get into that. I would love to (laughs) hear about that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, First of all, though, I just, I love that you wrote the book because it's, it's not one of these like, lose weight in 30 days and you know by doing xyz follow this 
exact diets and you actually are going against the grain and saying, you know what, it's so much more complicated than that. There's so much more going on that we're not understanding that people should be aware of, right? And let's just go into, first of all, the whole calorie restriction model that is so broken. And I know that a lot of your stuff, you'll, you know, you say like, yes, this can work. However, what is this also doing to us from an evolutionary standpoint? What's going on when we're doing these calorie restricted diets? Why do they work? And also why don't they? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, calories are a very important concept to understanding, you know, body fatness. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that focusing on calorie intake is the best way to regulate your weight. So if you look back, you know, at our ancestors, they weren't counting calories on smartphone apps and, you know, right. trying to regulate their fat yeah. that way. And yet they had, you know, much lower rates of obesity in those populations. And so basically just the way their brains worked and the way their brains interacted with their environment that was around them and the foods that were available and the food environment that they were in naturally led to weight regulation that created leaner bodies. And so, you know, that's the way that human appetite control and body fat regulation has always worked since the beginning of time. In other words, you know, another way to say that is that, you know, ancestrally, it's all governed by non-conscious brain functions, things that are just humming along in the background, just like you have brain regions that are regulating your heart rate that you're not aware of brain regions that are regulating your digestion that you're not aware of. There are brain regions that are regulating your appetite, that are regulating your cravings, that are regulating your body fat regulation. And all of those things, non-conscious, um, are those things in the right environment can naturally lead to a leaner body. And that's exactly what happened in the context of our ancestors. Um, and so you know, my approach is to try to say, hey, well, let's try to understand what these brain systems are. These basically these, you know, module, these brain modules that evolved for specific purposes to kind of hum away in the background and, and protect us really and help us to thrive and be healthy. That's what they evolved for. Um, how can we leverage those to support us instead of in the modern food environment, they are mostly opposing us by pushing us to eat too much because this is just not the environment they evolved for. They're basically misfiring because of a change of environment. And so that's kind of my perspective on, on things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as we were, when we were hunter gatherers, you know, we were wired basically to seek out high caloric foods, right? And, and it was for survival. So now that we have all this, food bombarding us in the grocery aisles, what's going on in our brain that's making us, you know, why don't we want the broccoli that has the micronutrients that our body and brain needs? Why aren't we driven to eat that? Yeah. It's really ironic, isn't it? Yes. It's, it's like, it's not fair. <laughs> we, yeah. And you see this most clearly in, in kids. Most kids don't really like vegetables. They want to eat refined carbohydrates and fats and butter and you know, all the like really calorie dense stuff, they don't really, most kids do not care about vegetables. They don't like vegetables. Um, and so why is it that the things that we should be eating, our brains intuitively don't want or want less. And then the things that we shouldn't be eating, the things that are destructive to our health and our weight are the, all the things that the brain really wants, the ice cream. Well, the reason is that our brains evolved to seek specific physical and chemical properties in food. And vegetables don't have those physical and chemical <laughs> properties and refined calorie dense foods do because we evolved, of course, under very different conditions than we're in today. You know, if you imagine a human hunter gatherer that was living similar to how our ancestors lived for most of the last 2.6 million years, you have someone who's foraging in a wild environment where it's hard to get food, right? And everything you come across is an unrefined food. Uh, most of those foods, not all of them, would be lower in calorie density and higher in fiber and maybe would have weird off flavors that, you know, today we might not necessarily enjoy. Um, and so, like, 
the overall picture is that you needed to have this very powerful motivational system driving you to get enough food, driving you toward those really calorie dense foods, the ones that were going to supply the energy that you needed to do all the things you had to do in a day, you know, to walk five plus miles, to build your shelter, to hunt an animal, to make a baby, to breastfeed. All those things are very energy intensive. And so really um, what it looks like is that our brains evolved, particularly our, the motivational systems in our brain, the ones that make us motivated to eat, evolved to seek calorie dense foods. And so they didn't evolve to care about riboflavin and vitamin C and potassium. Those are not things that we can taste. You know, we can taste fat, we can taste sugar, you can't taste riboflavin, you can't taste potassium. Those are things that the brain just did not evolve to be motivated by. And so, um, yeah, and so we carry those same things today. Um, those same substances that motivated our ancestors that our brains are wired to be motivated by, to crave and to want, um, we're really hardwired to crave things like carbohydrate and fat and protein and salt and umami, which is that meaty glutamate flavor that's in MSG and bone broth and stuff like that. Those are the things that really fire the brain up that get it motivated to eat food. And everyone in every culture around the world likes those things. Everybody likes salt. Everybody likes fat. Everybody likes sugar. Everybody likes starch. But what's different around the world is all the specific flavors, all the specific types of vegetables and spices and herbs and textures and things. Those things are particular to each culture. And those are learned. Those preferences are learned due to their repeated association with the fat and the sugar and the salt and stuff. But um, when, you know, when a child is born, they automatically hardwired like the ice cream and the cake and the cookies and stuff. They only learn eventually to like vegetables, maybe by virtue of repeatedly associated, associating those vegetables with fat and salt. And in your opinion, like when you look back on history as hunter-gatherers and even some existing tribes that are out there today, how much were vegetables actually part of our diets? Like, I don't think very much, were they? And because I think of right now, when you eat a salad, you don't want to eat a plain salad or plain vegetables. You want to put dressing on it. You want to put butter on it. You want to put the salt on it. You, we want to mask it. And so then I always ha think, like, how much did we actually eat? How much are we actually wired to eat this stuff? And should we be eating it? You know, how much of it should we be eating? I'd love your opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you look at the anthropological literature, there are examples of hunter-gatherers eating vegetables, which is, you know, uh, just to define that a low calorie plant food, um, like leaves or celery or whatever, but not a lot. I mean, you can find examples of it, but they're not really staple foods. Um, usually, cause I mean, if you think about it, you know, if you're going to spend three hours foraging and walk five miles to get dinner, are you going to be picking lettuce or are you going to be picking tubers that can give you the energy you need to survive? Or, you know, are you going to be hunting rabbits or antelope or something like that? You know, you're going to be going after the things that are going to sustain the fire of your metabolism. You're not just going to go after vitamins and minerals because you, you will be dead if you do that. Um, and so, yeah, they just don't really have that foraging strategy. But I have to say that, you know, in a hunter-gatherer environment, when they're harvesting calorie rich plant foods, things like nuts and tubers and fruits, um, those foods are very nutritious. So they're not eating any refined foods. And so basically just eating a whole food diet, even though it doesn't necessarily contain a lot of vegetables, they're getting all of those nutrients that we get by eating vegetables because those foods that they're eating are just naturally so, cal so uh, nutrient dense. And, and by the way, this is why I think they didn't evolve to, or, you know, we didn't evolve to, to taste and enjoy potassium is because in a hunter gatherer environment, if you're getting enough calories, you're getting enough potassium because all the foods you're eating are very nutrient rich. 
Yeah. Um, so you don't need to evolve to seek potassium. As long as you're seeking enough calories, you're getting enough potassium. So, um, yeah, so basically it doesn't make sense from a hunter gatherer standpoint to spend a lot of time foraging for just a few calories. And so we're not hardwired to do that. That said, I think there is a role for vegetables in the modern food environment because, you know, especially if you're talking about a more grain based diet, like more, most people eat grains have nutritional shortcomings and vegetables fill some of those, those shortcomings. Um, and this is why you see, you know, cultures that are agricultural that developed agriculture and rely primarily on grains they typically will incorporate complementary foods like beans for the complementary protein dairy for minerals like calcium and uh, vegetables for other minerals like vitamin c and potassium those nutrients are all low in a grain-based diet and so if you mix it up with complementary foods you're you can eat a nutritionally adequate diet so you know, it's not that I think that vegetables are not worthwhile today. Um, I don't think it's necessarily like obligatory to eat a ton of vegetables. I think if you're eating a whole food, and this is my opinion, but I think if you're eating a whole food diet that has plenty of, you know, plant foods, like if you're eating sweet potatoes and fruit and potatoes and things like that, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know that you necessarily need to eat a ton of vegetables. Um, but certainly, you know, the more your diet is tending toward a like grain based or especially refined grain based diet, I think the more benefit you're going to gain by including uh, larger amounts of vegetables. Right. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that it's people don't realize that meat actually like animal protein has more nutrients in it than kale does for instance like pound for pound people think that oh my gosh kale's the superfood or whatever greens are the superfood and they're great and i'm not saying don't eat them but people have to realize that's not what made us human it's not what grew our brain it's not what you know fat and animal protein grew our brain and i don't think a lot of people realize that right so it's interesting. And so how, you know, when you're looking at, actually, first of all, let's actually get into the whole fruit thing because we were, you were just saying, you know, if you eat these, you know, if you eat the whole food or if you eat a balanced diet, including the fruit, the potatoes, and there's a lot of like, oh my God, don't eat fruit, don't eat potatoes, don't eat, you know, don't eat any carbs at all. When the scientific research really supports that, you know, low, low fat, high fat, both of them show weight loss results, don't they? So can you tell us a little bit about kind of the research? Like, what are we seeing? Because right now everyone's on the keto diet, which I'm a huge supporter of, don't get me wrong, and paleo. But I always tell people there's actually research that proves even high carb diet, like the Kitavans, um, which you can talk about. I'd love to hear that too. Um, they eat nothing but tubers and they don't have any obesity. So tell us a little about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, back in the day, um, maybe like 11 years ago, I read Gary Taubes' book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, and I was really impressed with it. And I went low carb for about six months. And, uh, I kind of, one of the reasons that allowed me to kind of realize that a lot of that narrative was inaccurate was to see all of these non-industrial cultures all over the world. I mean, literally hundreds of cultures, billions of people all over the globe eating super high carb diets and not getting obesity, not getting diabetes, not getting cardiovascular disease. So I was like, eh, something's not quite right about this. Um, but, and that's, you know, but I, you know, I think it, it's more complex than that would make it seem because I think carbohydrate can contribute to obesity. It's not, it's just not the num you know, the sole cause of obesity. So it's one of the factors that can contribute. Um, but if you just have that one and not all the others, you're still going to be lean. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and I agree, you know, you see weight loss, you see fat loss on either end of the macronutrient spectrum on the low carb end and on the low fat end. And I think any, you know, true understanding of weight regulation has to acknowledge both ends of that spectrum. 
there's one diet actually I'll talk a little bit about and not at all recommending this diet. I just think it's kind of informative. It's called the rice diet. And this was, um, I think it was popular back in the like sixties through the eighties. Okay. This diet was literally nothing but white rice and sugar, almost nothing but white rice and sugar. And I forget what they, there was a little something for protein. I don't remember what it was. And people lost massive amounts of weight on this diet. And again, I'm not at all recommending that people do that, but I think it's kind of hard to believe that, you know, carbohydrate and sugar are the only cause of obesity when you see things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, that said, you know, I think low carb diets are a useful tool. So just to clarify for the audience that, you know, I, I think that a lot of people have found those useful and, and I totally support that. Um, and so as far as fruits concerned, so I reviewed the literature on that. And the reason I did it is because there's so much interest in sugar right now, which by the way, I also, you know, think eating less sugar is good. I don't eat much sugar myself. It's not something that I think is a health promoting substance, but right now there's like such intense focus on it that some people are saying, well, we probably shouldn't eat fruit either because fruit, most of the calories in fruit is sugar, right? So why would Mm -hmm. you want to eat fruit if sugar is bad? And, and I think it's only the more like extreme versions of that narrative that people are saying that. Um, well, so yeah, and there's not, talk, to, I've heard doctors say that are on the keto train or the carnivore train saying we would have eaten fruit to get fat, to, to get fat stores up before we hit winter. Like that was the whole purpose. Like you hit the fruit to get fat. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I disagree with that. And mm-hmm. I, I know, uh, you know, the the main person who's advocating for that and and i don't think he's an unreasonable person we've we've interacted some on on twitter um i don't really believe in the get fat for winter thing but i do believe his main point which is that when you mix abundant fats and carbohydrate together that's going to tend to be a fattening diet especially if they're calorie dense and palatable um and i mean that's what junk food is it's calorie dense palatable foods in a wide variety that mixes carbs and fats and is, you know, easily accessible and cheap. That's basically what makes people fat in a nutshell right there. Right. Um, It's good to clarify that. (laughs) Yeah. And so anyway, I'm trying to answer your question about fruit here. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, the, so the research that I found was, um, so I did a systematic review, which means I searched the entire scientific literature to find every study I could so that I'm not missing anything um, that would cause me, like if you just did a a search that wasn't systematic, you might be biased because you might only come up with studies one way or the other based on your search criteria. So I tried to find everything so that it would be unbiased. And then I reviewed all the studies. Um, I looked at um, randomized controlled trials that measured the effect of fruit intake on calorie intake. I looked at randomized controlled trials that measured the effect of fruit intake on body fatness. And then I looked at observational studies that just said, hey, you know, people who eat X amount of fruit, how much do they tend to gain weight over time? Do they gain, you know, more weight if they eat more fruit or do they gain less weight if they eat less fruit? And those are just associational studies. And basically what I found was all pretty consistent. Um, most of the literature suggested that fruit has um, either no effect on calorie intake and body fatness, or it has small effects to reduce calorie intake and reduce body fatness. So basically, it's somewhere in the neutral to slimming range. Um, and the literature was pretty consistent about that. And even like very high fruit diets. Like people I was going to ask that, yeah. Like, or the high sugar fruit. ones, like banana, like tropical fruits, they, they was the same? Uh, yes. Um, well, okay. There, there were some studies on guava. Um, and I, that's a tropical fruit. I don't actually know off the top of my head how, sh- how much sugar it has. So I, I can't really answer that I question, but, um, so I, I don't think I can really answer your question effectively based on what I remember off the top of my head. But, um, some of these diets were very high in sugar supplying like you know, up to, it was like 15 or 20% of calories from fruit sugars. So we're talking about a lot of fruit, you know, like talking about 
seven to 11 pieces of fruit a day oh, wow. of like oranges or apples or whatever. So, um, yeah, so we're talking about a lot of fruit yeah. and those diets tended to be slimming and, and I'm not talking about like massively slimming, you know, it wasn't like causing people to just totally, you know, shed tons of fat. But they were slimming, you know, people were losing a few pounds over the course of like a couple months. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so that's kind of the overall picture is it's either neutral or slimming. And, um, and yeah, so I think that suggests that, you know, the sugar itself is not really the problem. The problem is the package that the sugar is coming in. So if you're eating sugar in a very calorie dense uh, palatable way. Like if you're using sugar to put into cookies or cake or, you know, things like that, that have, uh, that are going to cause you to overeat, then that's very different than eating it in a lower calorie density, higher fiber, higher nutrient package, like fruit. So that, that was kind of the conclusion that I came to. So in all your years of study, have you basically come then to the decision that it's, it's more about just eating real food versus packaged food. Like, is it that simple? Is that, you know, I know that there's more to it and I want to, I want you to, I want to explore your six categories basically that you have of what you believe needs to happen to successfully lose weight. But when it comes to our diet and the research that you've done and you've done so much, obviously, is it really coming down to eat real food? Yeah, I think, I mean, it, from the, from a diet perspective, yeah, I think that is the main takeaway. And, you know, it's, I don't want to say that that is going to be like the optimal prescription for every single person in every single situation. But I think just as a blanket recommendation for eating a healthy diet for, you know, weight management and health. Yeah. I think focusing on whole foods, um, particularly whole foods that are cooked from single ingredients in the home and have a lower calorie density, I think that is really going to get you most of where you want to go. And if that's your rule of thumb, you might not hit the mark, you know, hundred percent of the time in terms of optimizing, but you're going to be hitting the mark, you know, 90 plus percent of the time. And I think, you know, that's, that's plenty. And do we need then to be going into a caloric deficit? It depends. I mean, I mean, for someone who wants to lose fat, they do need to go into a caloric deficit, but what I'm, you know, my perspective is that you don't necessarily have to uh, count your calories and deliberately restrict your calories and exercise portion control. What I prefer, what I think for most people is most sustainable. I mean, again, whatever works for you works and that's, and I support that. But um, I think for most people, what they find easier and more sustainable is to adopt a diet and a lifestyle and a food environment that naturally lead to a lower calorie intake. Because that way you're letting your non-conscious regulatory systems do their job, which is the you know, comfortable, uh, sustainable, the more comfortable, more sustainable way of doing it. Like if you just set up the food and the environment in a particular way and that leads you to a lower calorie intake just naturally because you want to eat less in that situation, that's easier and more sustainable than if you're sitting at the table and saying, no, I'm not going to eat, you know, the last third of my plate because I'm restricting my calories and doing that day in, day out for, you know, I don't know, 10 years, the rest of your life. So that's, that's kind of my perspective on, for most people, what's probably going to be the best fit. And, you know, with keto being all the rage right now, and we've even seen a lot of people starting to do carnivore where an intermittent fasting and 24 hour fasts we're seeing, you know, they, they really create a natural caloric deficit because of the foods that they're eating, right? I have a lot of clients that come in and they're, they're down to, you know, eight, 900 calories a day because they're fasting every day. And what is that doing to our system? What does that do to the fat mass set point? You know, what by, from an evolutionary standpoint, what happens when we, we do that for too long? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so just to explain to people, just to, to give a little framework so people understand your question, um, body fatness in humans is biologically regulated by a regulatory system that is located in the brain, particularly a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And basically, 
it works kind of like your thermostat roughly in that. Um, so your thermostat measures the temperature in your house and when the temperature deviates from the set point, in other words, the temperature that you programmed, then the thermostat kicks in with heat or air conditioning to bring the temperature back. It's called a homeostatic system or a negative feedback system. That's the technical term for it. But it's just a really simple system that's designed to maintain stability. So we have that. We have systems like that in many places in our bodies. One of them, or I should say, that regulate many things in our bodies. One of them regulates temperature, just like your thermostat. That's also located in the brain. Um, and then we have one that regulates your body fat level. And um, essentially, one of the key features of obesity that I think a lot of people don't um, aren't familiar with is that people with obesity actually have an elevated set point, which means that they are actively their brains are actively defending that higher level of fat mass against weight loss. And so, um, and this is not conscious. It's not like they're thinking consciously, "Hey, I don't want to lose weight." This is just a system, again, that's humming in your brain in the background that's regulating your appetite and your cravings and your physiology, and we don't have direct control over it. It's just a, brain, a non-conscious brain module. And so, um, and so basically what, the way this works is that when you start losing fat and you go below your set point, the brain starts kicking in these these responses designed to bring the fat back. So this is just like your thermostat. If your temperature drops, your thermostat kicks on the heat, right? To bring the temperature back up. Well, your brain kicks on a starvation response and the starvation response. And, and that's what I call it. That is what it literally is. Um, although the response is larger if you lose more weight and smaller, if you just lose a little bit of weight, it's all the same response. Um, basically what it does is it increases your appetite. It makes you require more food at a meal to feel full. Um, it increases your cravings and how your brain responds to food cues. So if you see food, it activates your brain more. And then it also slows down your metabolic rate. So it makes your body burn fewer calories and all those things together. That's a coordinated response to get fat back in your fat tissue. And it continues until you get the fat back and then, and then it turns off. So, um, so basically what you're asking is how does the ketogenic diet or other, you know, low calorie dieting affect that system? Um, and I think there are a couple of ways to approach this question. Um, one of them is to note that the set point is not, it, it's, it's different from your thermostat in this sense or maybe similar in, in to your thermostat in this sense is that it's not fixed for all time. It can actually be changed. Okay. Um, so whatever your set point is now, let's say you're at a certain weight. If you just do portion control, your brain and your body is going to fight it. Yes. But there are things that you can change that are giving different signals to these systems in your brain that regulate body fatness that actually make your brain want to regulate a lower level of body fatness. And so that helps you control your hunger, that helps you control your cravings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and low carbohydrate diets are one way, I believe, to do this. Low carbohydrate diets, low fat diets, um, both probably do it to some extent. So basically they allow your brain to be more satisfied. They allow your set point to drop a little bit and allow your brain to be more satisfied with a lower level of body fatness. Mm -hmm. So, and this is what people talk about when they go on these diets, they're not restricting their calorie intake deliberately. No. They're just eating the amount that they want to eat and it's less than usual calorie wise and they're losing weight. Mm -hmm. so their brain clearly is okay with what's going on in terms of losing that body fat. It's not ramping up their appetite to compensate. So I think that is a sign that the set point has decreased. Um, we don't have direct evidence of that, but I think that suggests indirectly that it is affecting it. Mm -hmm. And and again, we see this on both sides of the spectrum. We see it on low fat diets and we see it on low carb diets. It's possible that low carb diets do it more effectively. Um, and the more you restrict carbohydrate or fat, the more pronounced that becomes. So mm -hmm. I don't know that you're necessarily doing any damage by, by doing that. I mean, 
you see people, their calorie intake is going down, but it's not like people are becoming totally emaciated eating no. these diets, you know? Just the opposite. I find it eventually, it's just that what I see because I work with weight loss resistance is it stops, they stop losing weight eventually. Mm. And so their first reaction is to lessen those calories more or to cut more carbs mm. out. And I'm saying it's from an evolutionary standpoint, your body's just like the lower body weight you get, the yeah. more your body goes, ah, oh, we're going to stay here because your body doesn't like to get, doesn't like to lose a lot of weight. And so it will hold on. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think that's correct. Mm. And and basically, you know, even though some of these diets can move your set point, you're still going to hit a limit where your brain's like, no, this is where the set point is. And then you're going to have to struggle to get past that. Uh, and it might be an ongoing struggle because the truth is that there's no evidence currently that you can actually reset that set point permanently. So basically, if you are on a, let's say the keto diet, and let's say it lowered your set point by 20 pounds and you lost 20 pounds and, and you're feeling good. That doesn't mean that if you go back to your old diet, you're going to maintain that loss and that's your new set point. Your set point's probably going to go right back up and you're going to regain that weight. Um, and so, yeah. And so I think you're right. And basically the, the more extreme you go in your diet, I think the more you can lower that set point, so like if you're just doing a little bit of carbohydrate restriction, you might lower it a little bit. If you're doing a lot of carbohydrate restriction, you lower it more. If you go on the carnivore diet, you're going to lower it even more. And, and by the way, I'm not suggesting people go on the carnivore diet, but it does cause weight loss. There's no doubt about that. Um, and so, but yeah, if you, if you want to go beyond where your body is settling on that diet, you're either going to have to do something, you're either going to add, have to add something additional like exercise or something else, or you're going to have to struggle. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of, unfortunately, where we're at right now is if you want to maintain a weight loss, you have to maintain whatever intervention it was that caused that weight loss. Right. And what about fasting for setting a new lower fat mass set point? You know, as far as I can tell from the literature, fasting is not really any more effective or sustainable than just portion control mm -hmm. um, from the literature that I've seen so far. And, you know, this is on average. They're averaging together the effects from a lot of different people. And maybe it works, you know, really well for some people and not for others. And the average just isn't that great. But that's kind of what I've seen from the, the trials that have been done and the meta-analyses. Um, I think, you know, it's another way to control your calorie intake. And I think, you know, some people find it difficult. Some people don't, uh, if you don't find it difficult, maybe it could be a useful tool. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that fasting is easier in my experience. If you're eating a lower carbohydrate diet, yeah, same. if you're, yeah. Okay. So right okay. now I'm eating a high carbohydrate diet and fasting is more difficult for me. So Skipping a meal is not a big deal, but if I were to go 24 hours, um, I actually don't feel that bad. I just get brain fog, like, and I can't do my work. If, if I'm not yeah. thinking clearly, then I'm unable to, to do my work effectively. So I, I haven't been doing that. But, um, but at the time when I was eating a low-carb diet, going 24 hours without food was really no big deal. Mm -hmm. And you have these six categories that I would love just to give us a short description of these. These are the six kind of areas that you believe need to be addressed for successful weight loss. So your first one is the food environment, which you did touch on. Can you just explain that a little bit? What, what do you mean by food environment? Yeah, I think this is a really, really key one because you know the motivational systems in our brain that cause us to crave and cause us to eat food and often to overeat, those systems are often triggered by the sight and smell of food or even the context in which there's typically food. So, you know, if you walk into, let's say you walk into a meeting with some coworkers and in the middle of the table, there's a big, you know, box of open box of pizza or donuts or something like that, chances are, you know, 
at least if you're me, you're going to have a really hard time not eating those foods. Yeah. They're right in front of you. You're smelling them. You're seeing them. Those sensory cues are triggering uh, motivational circuits in your brain that are triggering cravings and that are driving you to eat those foods. And usually that'll happen even if you don't need the calories. You could be full. You could walk into the break room, you just ate, and suddenly you're eating pizza. Yeah. At least if you're me. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I think most people. Yeah. Um, and so, so, okay, so that illustrates the importance of the food environment, which is just all of the foods that are around you in your personal environment. So at home, you know, do you have a candy bowl in your living room? Do you have snacks sitting around? Do you have visible tempting things in your kitchen? Is there a box of cookies on the counter? Is there a six pack of soda? Um, you know, the more visible and easy to grab those things are, the more likely they are to trigger your cravings and desire and the more likely you are to consume them and to overconsume them. So really maintaining it as, as insofar as you can, a clean food environment at work and at home is, is really, really important for uh, getting yourself... Yeah, it's yeah. it's important for controlling temptation, for controlling your total calorie intake, and also for making sure that the foods that you are eating are really the foods that you want to be eating and not just kind of the foods that your non-conscious brain is pushing you into. Mm -hmm. I think we need to realize just how strong our brains are like don't don't underestimate those that the power of your brain telling you to reach out and grab the pizza the the donut and and don't trust it don't trust yourself with it i always say to women this is like the easiest weight loss hack don't have it in your house so even if you yeah. think oh i'm gonna just buy this for the kids or whatever it is i always tell my husband like you cannot bring ice cream into this house because I have to eat it then. So yeah. There's no control. Yeah, yeah. So if I need ice cream, I go out and buy one thing of yeah. ice cream and that's it because I can't control it. And yeah, if could just, you know, clean up their environment. It makes it so yeah. much easier to control And even it. if you can control it, why? I mean, it's effortful, it, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, why? Because you can, you can expend just a little bit of thought and effort to plan out your food environment and then that saves you so much effort later trying to resist these foods, often unsuccessfully. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, just saying, no, I'm not going to put the ice cream in the cart, that took a little bit of willpower right there, but it saves you so much willpower later. Oh, so much. Um, your other one is appetite. Yeah, so, you know, obviously appetite is one of the reasons that we eat. Uh, mm -hmm. hunger is one of the reasons that we eat and satiety is the main reason that we stop eating. And so, um, factors that affect that is, are one of the main factors that affect our calorie intake and body fatness. And so, um, just to, you know, try to keep it concise here. Um, I'll say that there are certain properties of food that cause them to be more filling than others per calorie. So since satiety is the thing that generally terminates our meals, we stop eating when we feel full, things that get us to that point faster with fewer calories are going to make our meals smaller and will generally reduce our calorie intake without creating that uncomfortable feeling like we haven't eaten enough. Mm -hmm. So, um, and those are foods that are lower in calorie density. So for example, oatmeal versus crackers. Oatmeal is mostly water. Crackers don't have any water, so the calories per weight or per volume is much greater for the crackers. So those are more calorie dense than the oatmeal, and the same number of calories of oatmeal is a lot more filling than crackers, just because that same number of calories is displacing more volume in your stomach, and stomach volume is one of the main things that determines your, your satiety. Also, the amount of fiber in your food, higher fiber foods are more satiating per calorie. Higher protein foods are more satiating, so like meat or eggs are quite satiating per calorie. And, um, and then foods that are uh, lower in palatability. So things that taste really, really good are not as filling per calorie, I'm sorry to say. But there's something that happens in your brain. It just flips a switch. and your brain's like, yeah, let's do this. And it shuts down your, your feeling of fullness. 
And so you can eat more. This is part of the reason why, you know, at the end of a big meal, you can be totally full and then you're ready for that bowl of ice cream or that slice of cake or whatever, because that very high palatability, that's one of the things that drives us to be able to have that second stomach Mm -hmm. that we really shouldn't have. Um, And so, yeah, so that's, that's really, um, those are some of the core Mm -hmm. principles for, for managing your appetite. And number three is food reward, which is kind of what you just touched on there. Like, so high food reward, you need to avoid it because you're going to, you're going to be triggering those things that you're talking about in the brain. That's going to tell you to eat more of it. Right. Yeah, that's right. So this overlaps a little bit with the previous one because food reward and hunger and satiety are actually pretty intimately linked in the brain. For example, if you are really hungry, foods taste better, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an example of the uh, satiety system impacting your food reward system and kind of turning the knob on there. But I think it goes in both directions where food reward can impact your hunger. So like, for example, you could have had a really healthy meal and then you come across, you know, a box of pizza and suddenly you feel hungry again, even though you didn't just a minute ago. I've experienced that many times. I think probably most people have. And so, um, and again, like dessert after a meal is another, another example of that. You could feel stuffed and then the ice cream shows up and you're like, maybe I'm not so full after all. I think I could, you know, I, I think I got some more room. Yeah, I think of turkey dinner and then you think, oh my God, I couldn't eat another bite. And then the pumpkin pie comes out and it's like, well, actually, maybe I can. Yeah, pumpkin pie is one of my weaknesses. Um, So anyway, um, yeah, so okay. So just to explain what I mean here by food reward, um, it's it's a a little bit more complex than what I'm going to say here. And if you want the whole explanation, you can read my book. But basically Mm -hmm. the key concept is that certain foods have properties that cause us to be more motivated to eat them than other foods. And we know this, you know, we know we like celery or we know that we're not as excited about celery as we are about pizza or brownies. Um, and that the, the reason is that certain foods have certain physical and chemical properties that trigger dopamine release in the brain that then motivates us to eat more of those foods. And so, um, some foods are so motivating by virtue of their properties that they just drive us to eat too much. And these are the things that we keep coming back to over and over again here, the pizza and the ice cream and the brownies. And so um, essentially managing food reward is all about limiting the availability of those foods that cause you to lose control. And, and I'm not talking about like going on a massive binge even although that would be true for some people, but just eating too much, Mm -hmm. eating more than you want to eat. There's certain foods that trigger your cravings and trigger your motivations to a degree that cause you to eat more food than you need to just fuel your body. And those are the kinds of foods that you need to watch out for um, when you're trying to manage your your waistline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so sleep, I love that you put sleep into it because people, they never think that sleep has much to do with the amount that they can lose weight or control their appetite. Yeah. So there are tons of observational studies suggesting that people who sleep less than I think seven hours a night tend to gain more weight over time than people who sleep more like seven to eight hours per night, seven to nine hours. And, um, Those now, those are observational studies, so not necessarily ironclad for establishing cause and effect. But we also have some randomized controlled trials where they show that actually, you know, in under lab conditions, if you restrict people's sleep, they tend to eat more calories. And not only do they eat more calories, but if you put them in a machine that allows us to see their brain activity and then you show them pictures of food you see greater activation of um, the brain regions that would normally respond to food when they see those pictures. So sleep restriction causes their brains to want food more. And it kind of seems to kind of activate that same starvation response that we talked about earlier, where the brain thinks it needs more calories, even if it doesn't really. And then that um, seems to result in them eating 
couple hundred extra calories per day. Wow. Um, yeah, it's actually a pretty surprisingly large effect, at least in these, you know, shorter term experiments. So I think, um, I think there's enough evidence for us to be really, you know, concerned about sleep Yeah, I think um, so too. and manage that if we're trying to prevent weight gain and, and lose weight. Yeah, just alone on what it does to the hunger hormones, the leptin, ghrelin, and then also our cortisol over time, which is your stress hormone, which will drive sugar cravings up in and of itself. So I think that's so multifactorial, like of how much can actually a deprivation of sleep will affect your weight basically. Right. So I love that. Um, and then we've got physical activity, which I think is pretty straightforward, <laughs> the physical activity <laughs> and then stress is another one too. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just say a couple of words about physical activity Absolutely. because I think yeah. a lot of people don't think it's straightforward. You know, you have all these media reports that exercise doesn't cause weight loss. Um, and basically I, I disagree with that. I think they're, I mean, it, very clearly they're like dozens of different randomized controlled trials showing that it does cause weight loss. It's not necessarily a silver bullet for obesity. It's not necessarily going to cause a lot of weight loss, but it does cause weight loss. And the more exercise you do, the more weight loss you experience, um, at least for the average person. Yeah. And the reason is that the, when you, you know, the calories you burn through exercise, you don't quite make up for those in increased appetite. You do work up an appetite, but generally people will not eat enough to compensate for what you burned. Mm -hmm. So there is weight loss that occurs. Um, and, yeah. and also it seems to act on the set point and allow you to be comfortable at a lower weight. So it's not just yeah. burning calories, but it's actually affecting that regulatory system that allows you to be more comfortable at a lower weight. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that it, I think, like you said, a lot of people think that, oh, exercise doesn't have anything to do with it because of what a lot of the research is showing now. And it's, I always tell people, it's more like, you know, we're looking at 70, 80% is, is diet and other means that are affecting your weight. But that doesn't mean that exercise doesn't have anything to do with it or can't have an effect on the body, especially what kind of exercise. I think that you know, there's so much of these like super hardcore workouts right now that can be super damaging to the body and you don't necessarily need to go that route. But on the other hand, we, we were meant to lift heavy things. We're meant to have that kind of high intensity interval training because biologically, once again, looking at the evolutionary standpoint, we, that's what we would have done as hunter gatherers. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, hunter gatherers would have had varied physical, very varied physical activity with a lot of walking, a lot of running and, you know, jogging and climbing and a lot of different things that they're doing. Um, a lot of shooting bows, carrying the dead animals, carrying dead animals, <laughs> carrying tubers and fruits and babies. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So yeah, obviously it's part of the evolutionary template. I don't think you could, anyone could make a credible argument that it's not. And I think, you know, the, um, the study, there are studies that suggest that exercise doesn't cause a lot of weight loss, but if you look at the protocols, usually they're really wimpy. It's like, it would be like putting somebody on a low carb diet and only reducing their carb intake by 5% and then saying low carb diets don't cause weight loss. You know, right. it's like, yeah, if you do a really wimpy intervention, you get a really wimpy result. <laughs> what do you expect? Um, but if you look at the studies that have more, uh, more, uh, intensive protocols, they do see greater weight and fat loss. Mm -hmm. And, and actually the weight loss can be misleading because exercise tends to preserve lean mass. So you can actually see more fat loss than you would expect from the amount of weight change, uh, with physical activity. So anyway, so yeah, I think, I think that works. It's not, it's not like a silver bullet for obesity, but it is, it is a tool and, um, yeah. Okay. So then stress. So yeah. stress, um, seems to promote, uh, excess consumption of calories and particularly harmful metabolic changes and body fat distribution changes for a couple of different reasons. Um, for at least a couple of different reasons, I should say. So um, stress activates a system in the brain 
that eventually results in the secretion of a hormone called cortisol that you alluded to earlier. And that is uh, one of the body's stress hormones. And it's one of the things it does is it goes into the brain and it acts on this body fat regulatory system. And it tells the system you can have more fat on the body. And so your set point goes up a little bit because of the actions of that in the brain. And so um, typically you will see, you know, people eating more calories and generally gaining the fat around their midsection, uh, especially, which is the, the, really the place you don't want to be gaining it because cortisol also changes your body fat distribution. Um, but the second thing it does, you know, we self medicate our stress by eating food mm -hmm. and we don't self-medicate stress by eating celery sticks. No. We self-medicate stress by eating comfort food and delicious calorie-dense foods. And so, and it, it works. I mean, you can, you know, they have human experiments and animal experiments. It, you know, it's not just anecdotal. It really does reduce uh, perception of stress and it actually reduces the activation of those um, stress response circuits in the brain. So it does work. Mm -hmm. and um and so that's another way that it can make us overeat and eat foods that aren't necessarily supporting our goals for ourselves um but one of the interesting things that comes out of the research is that food is not the only thing that can do that so there are other rewards that can dampen the activation of the stress response circuits in the brain so for example, sex is one that's been studied, particularly in animals. Because I mean, the truth is there's not a whole lot of things that can really compete with like ice cream and, you know, delicious, you know, brownies or whatever. There's not a whole lot of rewards that are that powerful. Mm -hmm. for, Alcohol for and drugs, that's the only other two that I think of. Well, shopping, yeah, shopping. I, think, I think there's sex. I think there's, mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe shopping, um, maybe some like, aspects of social interactions could be pretty strong. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that there are, there are many ways, even if they're not as strong, there are many ways to create a reward for yourself. So you can go for a walk, you can take a bubble bath, you can go out and garden, you know, sit in the sunlight and read a book. There are many things that you could do that would at least get you part of the way there enough so that you're not needing these comfort foods as a crutch Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, things that would help you dampen the activation of those circuits without, you know, causing you to undermine your own goals for yourself in terms of body weight and health. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And your book got, dives deep into all of this stuff. And if, if you're somebody that's struggling with this, which like I said, most people are, if they're trying to lose weight, I think it's one of the best, just knowledge itself is one of the best tools you can have. Learn why it is we're wired to eat this way. Get into it a little bit farther. You can find lots of content on Stefan's website, which I've dug into numerous times in the last couple of years. And you really, when you understand what's happening in your brain, it's so much easier, I think, to control it. I mean, I've learned so much. And, and now when I go to eat the, the sugary foods, I, I actually can say to myself, well, of course I want more because it's triggering the norepinephrine in my brain and it's telling me to go eat more of it. And I'll just wait 10 minutes because that'll all subside and I won't want to keep eating it. And, you know, I play, play with it in my own head quite a bit. So I think knowing about how this works is super important instead of believing everything that you're reading out there on social media as far as, you know, how it is you can lose weight. There is no one size fits all. And you really do need to put all of this into practice. He's got a great quiz on his website as well. And I'll link to that in the show notes, as well as his website, as well as where to buy the book, The Hungry Brain. And take the quiz, find out which area you need to work on. Mine, unfortunately, was stress and sleep. So <laughs> I was like, dang, I thought I had that covered. But no, they weren't horrible. But the other ones were all bright green. And okay. <laughs> I was doing really well on, that, <laughs> on the sleep and the stress. So you can take that quiz on his website and I'll link to it. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen, so much for coming and chatting with me today. Okay. Thanks for having me, Karen.